Hello and welcome. This is Think for Yourself, an introduction to critical thinking. And my name is Mark Thorsby. I hope you're doing well. This is our first video in a brand new series um, course that we're that I'm putting out, um, which is an introduction to critical thinking. Um, and you'll see that we're going to be using um, this textbook, um, a workbook for arguments, a complete course in critical thinking, second edition by David Morrow and Anthony Weston. You can get it online, um, either through Amazon or I believe going directly to the publisher's website. So feel free to follow along. And you, what you're going to see is in the video today, we're going to begin by just sort of asking a question, what does it mean to think for yourself? And then we're going to be looking at some of the rules for thinking. Um, the book is actually divided into a whole series of rules. I think there's 45 or 50 rules um, that you should use to be a critical thinker. So it's a great way to lay out the text and I think it'll be nice. Um, and so what I'll be putting together are basically short videos for each of these rules as we go through them in the course. So, and the second book that we'll be using as well is um, The Consolation of, of Philosophy by Alain de Botton. Um, and so feel free to get that book. We're not gonna be, um, this will give us a lot of um, speculation and, and different insights to think about. Um, so anyway, let's jump to it. So what does it mean to think for yourself? You've probably had people um, tell you that you should think for yourself, uh, or they say, I think for myself. What is exactly does it mean to think for yourself, right? Because on the other hand, you can see there's a number of related questions that immediately come to mind. Number one is, well, if we talk about the idea that we should think for ourselves, then that means we could ask, well, do others think for you? Um, and I think all of us do have certain ideas, or at least have had certain beliefs, and repeated certain beliefs, um, that were gives, simply given to us. Someone um, from a higher authority, our parents, um, a pastor, a priest, someone may have told you something, and they've decided something for you, and you've gone along and agree with it. So, do others think for you? Well, another question here is, well, why should one think for themselves in the first place? Why does it matter? Um, and hopefully, by as we go through this course, these questions will become answered, um, especially this first one, why should you think for yourself? Um, another question is here, well, how should one think? If we're supposed to think for ourselves, and that's what it means to be a critical thinker, then how should one think? Uh, it's worth noting here, in fact, that despite the everyone is always talking about critical thinking and we need to have a society with more critical thinkers and so on and so forth, but one of the things that's interesting is that um, scholars have noted that there is no consistent universal definition of what critical thinking even means. In fact, if you get a bunch of faculty members together at a college or a university and start asking them what critical thinking is, you'll find very quickly that they can't really define it. Uh, and this was actually, there's a great article um, by Mullenbelt and Sanders which uh, addresses this. Take a look at it. Um, so, but there is an important question of, well, okay, maybe we don't have a consistent definition of what critical thinking means, but how should we think? Uh, because it seems there's different forms of thinking, and it seems, looks like there's better and worse ways of thinking. And if there are better and worse ways of thinking, how can we come to knowledge of them? Um, so when we talk about critical thinking, there's a lot of different questions. Um, philosophically, when we ask, when someone says we should think for ourselves, or you should think for yourself, we can ask, well, what exactly does it mean to think at all? Um, what does it mean to have meaning, right? Uh, to think for yourself is so what does that mean right and then of course what is the self what does it mean to be an individual now these questions are not related per se to a critical thinking course but they're an example of the ways in which we need to think creatively about topics when we look at them and and break them down piecemeal what is it thinking what is meaning what is the self um, so what does it mean to think for yourself in order to understand that we have to understand these sorts of questions. One of the things I frequently tell my um, students is that the 
the the fuel of philosophy partially is the question so if you're going to be a good critical thinker you're going to have to cultivate your capacity to ask good questions and i know that in grammar school we always tell our our students and or we were told when we were students that there is no stupid question. I don't think that's exactly accurate. I think that there are better and there are worse questions. And as a critical thinker, you should hone your ability to ask good questions. Um, so um, let's just start off by here by thinking about thinking. Um, and let's just start off with some basic definitions. Now, let's start off with the etymology of the word to think or the word think. Um, etymology means the word history. The, the English word think actually comes from the Old, Engl Old English penken, and I don't think I'm probably pronouncing that correctly since I don't speak Old English, which comes from the German denken, which uh, means to think. And interestingly enough, the etymology, the original word uh, banking here, um, probably meant something like uh, to cause to appear to oneself, right? Because think about it, or when we think about what thinking is, it's very, very difficult to pin down. It's something that occurs in your head. It occurs subjectively. Um, it, it's something that is usually formulated in in words, though not necessarily, but it does always seem to be this sort of appearing to oneself. It's something that appears to oneself. So it's sort of interesting. Now, moving along with the word thinking, the Oxford English Dictionary gives two definitions. The first means to have a particular opinion, belief, or idea about something, right? So the first form here is really about having. Right? So in my mind, I have certain ideas, and these ideas appear to me in the forms of thoughts. Right? Um, so I have lots of these ideas. For instance, uh, I believe that Barack Obama is the President of the United States at the filming of this video. I hold that idea in my head. It's, an, it's not a really, I guess it's, a, it's an opinion and a belief in a certain way, but mainly it's an idea I have about the world. I have other ideas about the world. I have ideas about you as a, a, an aud as a person watching this video. I have ideas about the water, that, for instance, that I'm drinking. It's made of H2O. I've learned that from science, but we should note that I hold the belief that water is m made of H2O mainly because of my education, because of what I've read, not because I've ever done any sort of molecular analysis on water, right? I've never done any scientific exper any experiments. I've never seen any scientific experiments to prove that water is H2O. And yet I can still think that that's what water is. So on the one hand, when we think about thinking, there's a, there's a way in which we have certain thoughts, right? But then on the other hand, the second definition that the Oxford English Dictionary gives is that Think to think means to direct one's mind towards someone or something, to use one's mind actively to form connected ideas. So the so on the one hand, while I can have certain thoughts, thinking also refers to a type of doing, doing something, um, directing my mind in phenomenology now. My specialty in philosophy is phenomenological philosophy. Um, take a look at it. Um, Edmund Husserl is an important figure in the in the uh, the movement of phenomenology, and phenomenology is all about this question of what is the mind doing when you're experiencing the world. They call it intentionality. So when we talk about thinking, we can just sort of start off here by saying, well, on the one hand, we have certain thoughts, and on the other hand, we do certain things while we're thinking. So. So in a certain way, you might say that thinking can either be a noun or it can be a verb. It can be something, an object, as it were, or it's an activity of some sort. Um, and it's something that always occurs for each of us so long as we're thinking beings, right? Okay, so back to this concept of to think for yourself. Well, there's two immediate questions here I think that we should raise. And that the first one here is, well, okay, if thinking is about having certain ideas, well, what ideas should we hold, right? There's lots of different ideas. You can see I've got a whole bunch of books here. Um, you can go to a library and see a whole sea of books. You can go on the internet and get virtually any idea imaginable um, 
you know, presented before you on the computer screen. Well, out of all of this array of ideas, out of this sea of options, which of these ideas should we actually hold? And then secondarily, when we said that thinking is a way of doing, or it's doing something, well, that raises the question, well, how should we think? Um, and what does that mean exactly? The first answers I, I would give here is that, well, I think number one, we should hold ideas that are true, right? And I don't want to get into the philosophy of what it means to what truth is here, but in general, whatever conception of truth we hold, the ideas we believe or that we hold should be true ideas, right? Now, obviously, I can also understand and hold a false idea so long as I know it's false, but ideally, the opinions and beliefs and the thoughts that I want to think and, and keep to are the ones which are true. Now, how do you know it's true is a different question. Um, now, go back to the, in the second answer here in terms of how should we think, well, I think that we should think logically. Now, there's um, philosophers who have been working for a very long time, for multiple millennia, um, looking at the question of what it means to make logical arguments. And we'll talk about that. In many ways, a course in critical thinking is a course in, um, in logic and in formal logic, right? And so we'll talk about that a little bit, especially when we start talking about deductive arguments later. Um, of course, you can always take a look at, I've got a whole video series on an introduction of formal logic. Take a look at that if you'd like to learn more. So, but I think we need to hold true ideas and I think we need to think logically, whatever that might mean. And we're gonna see that these rules for critical thinking in the, in the workbook here are going to help us begin to practice thinking logically. Now, I think this means that we've got to admit a couple things. Number one, we have to admit that not all of the ideas that we hold are actually true, right? There are things that I have believed that I've come to realize later on that they were false. Think here, if you want, pause the video and ask yourself, what beliefs, opinions, or ideas have I held that were actually not true? Um, and in fact, many, many, many. And in fact, you think about history, right? Um, the fact that in, in ancient history, people believed a whole bunch of things that weren't true, for instance, about the stars and the heavens. And in fact, we too may even believe things right now that are not true. So we've got to admit that we're fallible. We've got to admit that some of the ideas we hold are false, right? The second thing here is that not all of our thoughts actually make sense. And this doesn't take hard. All you need to do is go on YouTube um, and... To, and listen to someone banter on about something, pretty much any subject. And if you think about it rigorously, for, you'll frequently discover that people's ideas don't actually connect. Notice that that definition we saw, that basic definition for reasoning, uh, had to do with the idea that our ideas should be connected. Right here it is, right here, right? To form connected ideas. And whatever it means to have logic means that um, we have to, that, I'm sorry, let's put it this way, a logical argument is an argument in which all of the statements that you make are connected. But this isn't the case when we actually live life. A lot of the ideas we have don't actually make sense. So we believe some things that aren't true, and some of the things that we do believe don't even make sense. And what's worse, some of the ideas that are not true do in fact make sense. That is, sometimes the false ideas, the false beliefs that we have make sense. They're logical, but they're just not true. It's not the, the world is not the case that such and so is, is as we might think. Um, the second thing here is that sometimes we don't even know how to, how to make sense of that which is true, right? So sometimes there are things that are true and we just don't know how to make sense of them. So that means that I think that critical thinking has to begin with the, with really a, a dose of humility. Um, we don't know everything. And in fact, only when you can come to recognize that you have been the victim of your own ignorance will you come to the recognition that one should think critically and ultimately 
the, you have to think for yourself. Now, let me give you an example here. Consider Aristotle's cosmology. Now, I know many of you are not Aristotelians and, you know, and maybe don't care or know about the history of philosophy or the history of cosmology. Uh, now, let's define that. Cosmology is the study of the cosmos, right? It's the logic of the cosmos. So, it's, cosmology basically tells you your theory of the universe, really, right? The planets and the stars and all that. So, Stephen Hawking, for instance, is a cosmologist. But cosmology goes all the way back to Aristotle. Now, Aristotle had a, ver uh, a cosmology that was very, very different than our own, right? In our cosmology, that is modern Western cosmology, um, right? We have a heliocentric model of the solar system, right? You have the sun and then the, all of the planets revolve around the sun, right? And then there's multiple solar systems that form galaxies and so on and so forth, right? This is our contemporary cosmology. This is probably what this is what you would learn if you took an astronomy class. But Aristotle's cosmology was very, very different, right? For instance, his view was that the Earth was the center of the universe, and that around, he had this, um, uh, this sort of, yeah, well, let me put it this way. He, he believed that the Earth was the center um, of the stars, and that uh, around the Earth were all of the planets and the sun that were, revolving around the earth you can see here and they, they revolved in, in cycles uh, right so you had the lunar you had um, the, the moon lunar you had mercury you had venus um, solus here was the sun and then you had mars and so on and so forth and you had a very complicated system now we know today that this view of the universe this cosmology is false it's not true but guess what? It does make sense to a certain degree. And it had to do with the fact that Aristotle's entire cosmology, his whole philosophy, his science is based upon observation, right? What we can observe directly is how we can gain knowledge of things, he thought. And so when he looked up at the stars, what he noticed that everything is moving. And it's all moving around us, and it seems to come back again. Um, so, it, it, so at night, um, for instance, you'll see the, the, the stars start to move in sort of an arc, and then in the next day you'll see them again. And so it looks like, from our perspective, that the stars are revolving around us. And so using that, um, that experience uh, of the say, experiential observation of the stars um, and of the planets, Aristotle postulated this theory. And this theory makes sense, but guess what? It's not true. Right, and what's even more astounding is that it's not true for a reason that would be have been very difficult for Aristotle to have realized that he was wrong, namely the certainty of his own experience. After all, when you look up and you see the the, the moon moving over time in the in the sky, right, you have a direct experience of that, and it looks like it's the moon that's moving, right. And we won't get into those because the moon is actually moving, right? But Aristotle's whole theory here is based upon the certainty of his own visual experience. And so you can see here that even our own experience is not enough. And you look at our own model. How is the heliocentric model organized? It's organized mathematically, right? And it's organized around the idea that the sun is revolving. I'm sorry, that the, the planets are revolving around the sun. The, the moon is revolving around the earth, which is revolving around the sun. And ultimately, through a complicated, uh, well, it's not that complicated, but through a theoretically complex uh, equation, we can make sense of it all. That is, we can make sense with reason why the stars move the way they do, not with our eyes, with our observations necessarily. So you can see here that even someone who's extremely brilliant and astoundingly genius, as it were, Aristotle, right? Even Aristotle can be wrong. So it's really imperative here that we, we recognize that the, it's really essential that we think for ourselves. Now, how does one think logically or clearly? Uh, and how does thinking logical help us hold true ideas. Now, that is, what's the relationship between logic and the truth? Now, I'm not going to untangle that, but I want to tell you a little story here about Socrates. Here he is. He's, 
our snub, he's the most important probably philosopher in history. Uh, in fact, that so much so that um, the philosophers that come before him are just called the pre-Socratic. So philosophers really see Socrates as this pivotal moment. We won't go into why that's the case. He lived from between 470 to 399 BCE. Now, Socrates was this guy who lived um, in Athens, in ancient Athens, um, after the Pelopon during and after the Peloponnesian War. And, one, and he was an old man, at least by the time he was doing philosophy. And one of the things he would do is he'd go down to the Agora. The Agora was a marketplace. And he'd go out and he'd just talk to people. Um, and he would begin to exchange ideas and have conversations. Socrates himself was not like the other philosophers of his period. He had no teaching in the sense that he didn't tell people how they should, what they should believe and what ideas they should hold. Rather, what Socrates did is he just inquired into the ideas that other people held. So he didn't say that one idea was wrong or right. He just said, well, what is it you think? Let's think about it, right? He is the par excellence example of a person who could think for themselves. And he initiated what later became known as the Socratic method. That is a certain way of engaging in discourse and in dialogue with another person. Um, and so from the Consolation of Philosophy, whoops, there's a misspelling there, by Alain, ba Alain de Botton, uh, we have here a sort of step-by-step um, -step description of the Socratic method. The Socratic method always begins where there's two people engaging, Socrates and his interlocutor. Now, the first thing that happens is Socrates would locate a statement um, that's confidently described as common sense, right? So, for instance, someone would say, for instance, in the Republic, uh, would tell Socrates, um, um, Thrasymachus, that justice is the right of the stronger over the weaker, right? Justice is just letting the strong man win, right? Justice is defined by the victor, right? These are ideas that are people believe in Thrasymachus thought were common sense. So find a statement that's, that, we do, that is confidently believed to be just common sense truth. Now imagine for a moment, stage two is imagine for a moment, despite the confidence of the person proposing this idea, that the statement's false. So just imagine the statement's false, and then search for situations or contexts uh, where the statement would not be true. So you just imagine, well, okay, Thrasymachus, if justice is just the stronger exercising their will over the weak, then why is it that a court, for instance, uh, would protect the weak person um, against the stronger person, for instance. You can't just, the, a person who's strong just can't steal other per people's property, right, and so on and so forth. Now, that's not a very good example, but you can see the second method here is then to try to figure out in what ways and in what possibilities, uh, or what possible universe, if you will, that the statement that's taken as common sense or believed to be held as true Imagine it's false, and under what conditions could it be false? Now, if you're able to find an exception, then that definition has to be false, at least imprecise in that instance. So that means there's a problem with this definition. So that means that the initial statement must be nuanced to take the exception into account, and this forces the other person in a dialogue or a dialectic exchange to ultimately to give a new definition, right? Um, and then from there, it keeps going. Now, if one subsequently dins explanations to improve statements, the process should be repeated. The truth, insofar as a human being is able to attain such a thing, lies in a statement which it seems impossible to disprove. It's by finding out what something is not that one comes closest to understanding what it is. And so the idea here with the Socratic method is, okay, if you don't know what to believe and someone else says that they, they know it's true, then you should inquire with them. And you should um, critically engage them by supposing that they're wrong. And then trying to find cases in which they would be wrong. And if there is no such case, well, maybe they're right. And, and if there are cases, well, then their definition can't hold. And so the, the, I, the basic sort of principle at stake here that Socrates reveals um, is that the product of thought, there should be a T there, the product of thought is superior to the product of intuition, right? Uh, so, Socrates here, I think, begins to help us see how logic, how the process of how we should think, 
consistently connecting things together, right, um, relates to this problem of what ideas we should hold as true. And we might say this is that true ideas are gained negatively. That is, it's not so much by proving things as true, so much as disproving things which are not true. Right, so it's not by proving the truths so much as disproving the non-truths. So this means that knowledge is achieved and gained dialectically. There's this natural process where we have an idea, a thesis, and then we discover that our th our original thesis, our original idea was wrong, and so we have an antithesis. And then ultimately, in order to overcome that, we postulate a new idea, a new synthesis, and then that synthesis gets its antithesis and so on and so forth. You can see there's a sort of uh, corkscrew process to how we gain knowledge. So I, as a human being, I'm born in the world, quite simply, just like you, and I go to school and I'm taught a whole bunch of ideas. And then what I should do is I should question those ideas. Some of those ideas will be proven to be wrong, at which point I'll get new ideas. And then I have to question those ideas, at which point new ideas will emerge. And so knowledge, takes this process of slowly building. Um, and this is what Plato called the dialectic. And ultimately, to be a good critical thinker is to engage in this dialectical progress of moving forwards, right? So in a certain sense, we can say that the doing of thinking is a necessary ingredient for the holding of true ideas. The doing of thinking is a necessary part for the holding true ideas. So when we ask the question of to think for yourself, we could say that to fail to think for yourself is to choose ignorance, right? Ultimately, if you don't think for yourself, you're not engaged in this process of gaining new ideas and thinking of connecting ideas together, which means that you're choosing ignorance, which means that you're going to live ignorantly. Um, and what does that mean? It means that you're going to, um, I think it's there's a, a verse some in the latter part of the the um, New Testament um, where it said something. You're like a blind man staggering around in the dark. Um, this is what ignorance is. Here's a great picture of Socrates at his trial. Now, Socrates' dialectical method in his process of engaging in conversation, disproving people's ideas, proving new ideas, and so on and so forth. This process meant that Socrates became very very unpopular. Um, he became unpopular for the obvious reason. No one likes to be proven wrong. And so what happened ultimately is because uh, Athens was a sort of democracy at the point, sort of quasi-democracy, um, he was held for trial. Um, and unfortunately, he was found guilty of corrupting the youth with his new method and his process of confusing people, they thought, and of being proclaiming false gods, of being impious. And he was proven guilty. I mean, in those days, Socrates, most people, if they were proven guilty for such things, would just be banished. But he was not banished. Instead, he was executed. Um, uh, Aristotle would later call this a great sin against philosophy. But in his trial, which is recorded in Plato's Apology, we have this beautiful phrase, which really is at the core, at the very center of what it means to think for yourself. Socrates says, listen, the unexamined life is not worth living. And so that's why he says, listen, if you don't want me to go day in and day out and examine the ideas that we hold so that we can examine the way we're living our lives, if you don't want to do that, then guess what? You should execute me because life is no longer worth living at that point. So why should we think for ourselves? I think one of the reasons is ultimately that the unexamined life is not worth living. And ultimately, I don't think we have a choice. We have to engage in this. Now, how should one think clearly? Um, and that's what a lot of this course is really about. How should you think clearly? On the one hand, we can say that to think clearly means to engage in logic. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But what is logic, you might ask? Well, logic is the science of arguments. What is an argument? Now, people argue amongst each other. That's not what we mean by an argument in logic. An argument is when you provide reasons um, for holding a specific idea. Um, you provide evidence for a specific claim. 
This is what logic is about. It's about connecting ideas in order to hold or accept other ideas. It's linking ideas together in order to move us forward in terms of um, claiming, in terms of proving that certain claims are justified or unjustified, worth holding or not worth holding. So this is what logic is ultimately about, and this is what critical thinking is concerned with. Now, we're going to be going through a whole bunch of, book, of rules um, of critical thinking th throughout the next semester, uh, throughout the next couple months here with this workbook. The first rule for thinking clearly is you just have to begin by figuring out what, what someone is claiming and what their evidence for those claims are. This is what we call identifying premises and conclusions. Right, that's the first rule. Um, because to think clearly, you have to understand what someone's arguing. And in order to understand what someone's arguing, you have to first differentiate, number one, what is the claim they're making that they want you to agree with, that they, want, that they hold and they want you to hold, and number two, what is the evidence they're using to support that claim. You have to identify premises and conclusions. So, so first off, you just have to ask yourself when you're confronted with an idea, an argument, is first off, what's purportedly being proved here? That is, what's the idea that they're giving me? So you can ident first identify the idea that's that we're supposed to that's to be believed here. This is what we call the conclusion. And what are the reasons or the evidence that it get, that are given? Well, those are what we call the premises. Um, and so we have to first differentiate those two together. And sometimes it's not easy because they're not usually in order, they're in different orders. Um, and there's also a whole bunch of different types of evidence and reasons that can be given for specific ideas. For instance, you can think of in mathematics, they give arguments, right? But they're mathematical arguments. There's also psychological arguments. There's deductive arguments. There's inductive arguments. There's abductive arguments. There's a whole range of types of arguments and reasons that can be given for certain sorts of claims. So when we talk about this first rule, rule number one, identify premises and conclusion, there we're just saying figure out what the, cl the claim to be believed is and then figure out what the evidence and reasons are that are given. Differentiate the two. So here's two examples from the textbook from page three. Um, and this first one, I believe, comes from um, Winston Churchill. He says, I'm an optimist. It does not seem to be much use uh, being anything else. Now, that's like one of the quintessential Winston Churchill quotes. It's pithy, it's funny, but it's also true. Um, and you can ask here, okay, what is the conclusion here? And you should always start with the conclusion. Well, the conclusion in this case is, I am an optimist. This is what he wants you to believe. This is the statement he's making about himself that he wants you to believe. And what's his reason? Well, his reason is there's no other, there's not much usefulness in doing anything else. That is, in not being an optimist. And so you could say that this second statement is the premise. Um, take a look at here. A do, this one comes from a Sherlock is comes from Sherlock Holmes book. A dog was kept in the stalls, and yet, though someone has been in and fetched out a horse, the dog had not barked. Obviously, the visitor was someone whom the dog knew well. Right? You can. This sounds like Sherlock Holmes here, um, and you can see here. Okay, what's the conclusion, and what are the premises? We'll take a look here. Um, and th you can see this, this second example is not as easy, um, right? Uh, but the conclusion here in this case is going to be this last statement. Obviously, the visitor was someone whom the dog knew well. Now, why is it, now how do we know that this is the conclusion? Well, the answer is because the reason that we know that the, the visitor was someone the dog knew well was because the dog didn't bark even though someone was taking the horses out, right? So that's the reason. That just means that this huge section here, right, this chunk, is the reason, it's the evidence that's given for us to believe this final statement. Now, th sometimes you'll see the conclusion can even come before the premises or before the reasons or evidence. And so one of the things you have to do, I frequently tell my students is, ask yourself, what's the takeaway? If I, if I read this phrase or someone told me this, what is it that they want me to walk away 
believing. Whatever you answer to that question will be your conclusion. So when and now, just ask yourself, what's the takeaway? Um, but there is some helpful ways to differentiate conclusions from premises. And these are by, by using what we call indicator terms. A lot of times in English language, and not just in English, but in all languages, there are certain words that we use to tell the people we're speaking to, to either our readers or to our listeners, um, to signpost them, to signpost for them, what our conclusions are and what our reasons are. We don't always use them, but we do very, very frequently. So a lot of times we have conclusion indicator terms where just before the conclusion, you'll see the words therefore or thus, hence, so, consequently, this shows that. If you ever see these words just before or at the beginning of the statement, that typically means that that statement is the conclusion of an argument. Um, conversely, we also have premise indicator terms. For instance, we have because, right? Something someone says, um, the dog must have known who um, the dog must have known who the visitor was because the horse had been taken out of the stall and the dog hadn't barked. Notice that. I can even just drop in this word because right into the spot where the premises would go. Right, so because is a premise indicator term. Also, since, given that, for, on the grounds that, this follows from, blank, blank, and blank. So when you see these words just before a statement, that typically means that there's a premise. So even though the words are, the, the premise and the conclusions can become in different arrangements, a lot of times what, what speakers and what arguers do is they give these indicator terms to help their audience understand. Now, this isn't always the case. Sometimes they, there are just no indicator terms available. So what I would encourage you to do is when you're taking a look at arguments and you're trying to determine what the conclusion is from the premise, first consider the context. A lot of times, if there are no indicator terms, it's to presume that it's obvious by context what's the conclusion and what the premises are, right? That means, and also you can't always rely upon indicator terms. Sometimes the indicator terms are not exactly uh, identifying a conclusion or a premise because sometimes we use those same words, like the word because, in things that are not arguments, such as explanations. So when I'm explaining something, I'll use the word because, but that's not an argument to be proved, right? Uh, I'm not trying to prove it, I'm just trying to explain it so you understand something. This is called the difference between, well, a, a, an argument has a premise and a conclusion, whereas an explanation has an explanandum and an explanons. Um, and so they have a sort of similar structure. So you can't always rely upon indicator terms. And another one here is some statements are just not arguments. They're what we call non-arguments. Think if someone tells a joke, that's not an argument. Someone asks a question. Someone says that, that they like the spaghetti. Um, those are not arguments. Those are statements, and they have different function in language. So you have to be on the lookout here because sometimes there's, you'll be, might be looking at something that just frankly is just not an argument at all. Think of also of a command, for instance. Um, another helpful piece of advice I would give you is always start by determining the conclusion first. Always figure out the conclusion is what the takeaway is first, and then figure out which premises are relevant or, or whatnot, and ask yourself what the takeaway is. So let's give an example here. Take this argument. In order to prosper, a democracy needs its citizens to be able to carry out their responsibilities competently. Being a competent citizen requires familiarity with the basics of math, natural science, social science, history, and literature, as well as the ability to read and write well and the ability to think critically. There's the thinking critically, right? A liberal education is essential to developing these skills. Therefore, in order for a democracy to prosper, its citizens must get a liberal education. So this is sort of a long sort of statement here. It's ultimately an argument. And first off, I hope you noticed we have a conclusion indicator term right here, therefore. So therefore, tell this the, the placement of this indicator term tells us that the final thing that they want us to believe, 
the claim that they're making that they want us to hold is that in order for a democracy to prosper, its citizens must get a liberal education. Well, why? Because in order to prosper, democracy, blank, blank, and blank. You see here, here's one, uh, a demar here's one premise, here's a second premise, and then a third premise. So there's actually three premises here, three different sentences, building up to a final conclusion. Typically, or typically, an argument should only have one conclusion with multiple premises. It's possible for an argument to have one premise, um, like we saw in the Winston Churchill example. It's also possible for an argument to have lots and lots of premises. One of the things to watch out for, too, is that sometimes some premises are not stated, right? Um, so you'll get someone will say uh, an, a con someone will give the conclusion. Uh, but leave out a premise because they assume that you can just remember what the premise is or you can figure out the premise is on your own. These are called enthymemes, uh, where you have an, uh, arguments with missing premises or conclusions, and it's just presumed that the reader or the listener will knows what they're talking about, can figure it out. This is often a device in writing and in speaking because people don't want to hear people repeat things over and over precisely. It's assumed that people can remember what we're talking about. Um, and that has to do with context and so forth. So watch out for that too when you're looking out for premises and conclusions. Um, so what you're going to do now is now that we've taken a look at this, go ahead and take a look at the exercise set for rule one um, and complete those um, exercises where they're going to get where the authors of the book will give you an argument. You have to figure out what the premises are and what the conclusion is. Thank you for watching. Think for yourself. I look forward to seeing you on, next time on our next video.